Good evening from Yummy Bee TV. Wish you all well today. Sending loads of love as usual. Um, I'm going to keep with the theme of the drug dealing subject for a little while, right? This week, or for a couple of days, if you like. Uh, we talk about kingpins. We talk about the top of the tree. We talk about all the big players that have ever played this game with drugs. And we're talking about the ones at the very, very top that have the one link where you can go and get 100 kilo, 200 kilo, whatever amount you want, you can go and get. So there's always one man that can get that. But there's always also other men underneath him who will have other, other men underneath them who will have money to spend, which they will give to them to go and spend with him, the big man, and everybody's involved. So it's a dangerous game, uh, big time drug dealing, because it is a chain. And I always believe that wherever there's a chain, there will always be a weak link. So I'm gonna take you lot back uh, to my earliest memory, because you know that I wasn't a drug dealer. All, all I can say to you is that I met many and probably some of the biggest ones that ever existed, if there is such a thing, if you get what I mean. Uh, one was from my area of Northwest London. Uh, we'll say that his name has the name of a fruit. So we're not talking about a banana. We're not talking about an orange. We're talking about another, another name of a fruit, right? But he's one of my besties and he's done a long, long time uh, for a crime that was probably the first of its kind in England. So what I mean by that is, say, the early 90s, uh, when we're looking at New Jack City and we're looking at all the American films and we're looking at factories, if we want to call them that, or we're looking at them as basic, basic higher-grade drug dens, not trap yards like they use today, not crack houses where you knock on a door and you can go and buy half a six and that kind of stuff. We're talking about a house with security gates, probably be one, two, three, with all cameras everywhere so that you can see from that side of the road and that side of the road. And I'm talking about, I mean, all the up-to-date stuff that could have been around at that time, which would have been about 90, 91, 92. Now, I, I, I first met uh, this fruity geezer uh, in the 80s. And he, all he used to do was stand outside a place called Salamis, which was in Kilburn, and sell boxes, pieces of ash out of a, bo a, um, uh, uh, a, a Swan's Vestas box, um, the red matchbox things. You remember, he used to get them in the little sticks. So that's all I remember him by. Uh, so he's old school. So I've done a couple of sentences, come out, now he's on a different thing completely. I keep hearing his name while I'm out for those short periods. I'm thinking, yeah, but I know this geezer. Right. During this time, I had my first experiences, like I told you, of visiting crack houses. I only appeared for a few weeks because I wasn't out that long. Uh, but they're sorry, sorry state places. Uh, and basically a crack house knocking on the door, security, a doorman's at the door, lets you in, knows you, yeah, yeah, comes in, buys half a six, buys what he wants to buy. Uh, but the places I'm talking about now are completely different. I went in there to this place, the fruity place now, uh, which was over Northwest. Uh, so it's common knowledge, it is, it's, it's in books and things like that. Uh, and I could not believe the layout. Uh, so gates, cameras, knock on the door, as soon as the door opened, three or four faces that I knew from jail straight away and that I knew from when I was a younger kid. So straight away, yeah, yeah maybe, yeah, everything cool, yeah, da, 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 da. I had a quick look into the kitchen and all I could see was uh, kitchen stoves or pots of things being washed up in, you know, like massive amounts. And I was thinking, wow, I ain't seen this kind of stuff before. So this was the first time I'd seen such a house being run the way that it was being run. So you had about 10, 12 geezers in there, probably doing night shifts, day shifts, probably changing over, you know, different uh, men doing different pieces of work on different days and different times. So I was pretty pleased to see him. So he's seeing me and he's going, yes, yummy, everything cool. Yeah, game's moved up now, different thing. You know, you can see straight away that everyone in that area probably is going there to buy their drugs, right? Whatever they're buying from 
five ounces to half a box to nine a nine bar they're going there that's that that's how that's how i saw it that's how i remember it anyway but i also remember that he, he got the biggest sentence that i first saw for that kind of thing as well he got 18 years and a five-year sentence uh if he doesn't pay back uh you know what they give you what are they called again uh when you got to pay back the money uh, i forgot the name of it anyway but you've you got to pay some money if you you know and if you don't pay the money uh the five years you don't it's not half or whatever you have to serve the whole sentence uh before you're let out completely so not only have to you do you have to do the confiscation orders yes oh, sorry confiscation orders so you do the 18 years which was them days two thirds 12 years and then you're running into your confiscation all the time which was a five stretch which he's refusing to pay which i would refuse to pay because i certainly ain't going to be paying any money that i've earned uh basically after spending over a decade in jail where money's probably going to be running out money's probably going to go missing uh i'm hearing a lot of the time during uh when things like these these things happen a lot of people take liberties when you get nicked anyway because you're not going to be around uh old outstanding debts they don't get paid do they let's have it right everyone takes it as a normal I, I haven't seen him i rang him he said yeah don't worry i'll get back you lose touch with everyone so money's owed to you and you're not getting it basically so it turns out that i think I've some, i ended up somewhere with him three places on that sentence and he had to serve the whole sentence, right? And then I, I, I had the fortune of getting to see him while he was out as well. Uh, as far as I know, he's still around. I think he might be living in Jamaica now. Uh, one second. Uh, he might be living in Jamaica now, but that was the first time, that was the first time I ever saw a house of that kind of standing and security. And this was the early 90s, right? Now, also what I found in the drugs game as well is that everybody's always looking the biggest link. Now, the biggest link is the man you want because rather than going to say that man I'm talking about, uh, where you have to go and buy five ounces, nine ounces, everyone in that area would have been buying drugs uh, of various amounts of him. Uh, because you know it's good, you know it's coming fresh, whatever, 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 right? But during that game, and what I saw, especially in the Cays, uh, is that where there's a chain, there's always a weak link. And sometimes a drug dealer's dream is, you know, is, oh, get me the link, I need the link, I need the big link, get me the big link and I'm made and whatever. You know, that's what a drug dealer will, well, what I used to witness when I was younger, that was a drug, de drug, drug dealer's dream. So during that sentence, right, in the 90s, got five, six, seven, eight different geezers all serving 10s, 12s, 14s, 9s or whatever for drugs. And there was a couple of Turkish men around doing Big Bird at that time. We know who they might have been. And rest in peace, one of them now, Kubalai, uh, one of my friends. I liked him. He died in prison, didn't even get to finish his, his, his sentence, uh, apparently. So I hear uh, through, through uh, uh, normal uh, circumstances, Ill, he got ill and he died and he never recovered. Uh, but on the first set of sentence he did, uh, he was all right, right? So... He was the link to all the rest of the other ones looking for the big link. So he knew who the big link was, right? So the big link was in another country. And it so turns out that everybody is happy at first because when they get out, they know they don't have to go searching. They know that as soon as they get out, their game can resume straight away because they got the big link. So they're going through this man and that man and this man, uh, not just the one I'm talking about, Kubi, but obviously there's a couple of other Turkish men as well. Uh, but the man that, that went the other way, who, because I always believe there's, like I say, there's a weak link. And when you're dealing with so much amounts of big gear, there are always going to be those big players that give up uh, the smaller men, if you like, the ones that you, that, that you are selling to. It's a fact. 
uh, and it's a very dangerous game and it causes murders because not only do you have, as far as I'm concerned, you have a lot of men putting their money into drugs that might not be drug dealers. Like you could be a criminal uh, making money, but you know, someone comes with an offer saying, yeah, borrow me 60, 80, 100. I'll get that back to you and give you 20 on top or whatever. And it's a safe bet. You know, I've, I've got the link, everything's cool. And he will go for it. He, if more than likely, because it's more money for him and it's an easier, easier way. He doesn't have to do much to get um, his reward. Uh, but, you know, there's always that chance that he might not get it, if you get what I mean. Because if that person that he's dealing with gets nicked, then he doesn't get his money. But he will still want his money. You don't worry about that. But anyway, they all met on that sentence. And then when I came back to the Cat Aids years later, um, after the millennium, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Because everywhere I turned, there was someone from that other sentence from before. And they were all drug dealers. And they were all from the same batch of men looking for the big link. And they were all blaming each other. And not only that, one of them uh, got observated and got tracked down after going to meet one of the big men. And the police ran up on him, followed him from somewhere, got him on the floor. He said, oh, he was banged to rights with a truckload. Uh, and he got 20 odd years. And even when he went back to prison, the ones that he owed money to um, on other things uh, were angry with him, stopped talking to him because he couldn't pay them their money, obviously, because all his money went into that one thing where he thought, if I get this, uh, I'm made for life and I don't really have to worry about money no more. But sadly, it didn't work out and he got nicked. And so did loads of others as well, apparently coming from the same big link. So Kubelai was getting a lot of the blame. I remember he kept coming to me every day, rest in peace, my boy. He kept saying, yeah, me, man, everyone's blaming me for introducing them to this guy when they were the ones that were asking me to introduce him to them so that when they get out, they could get their part in the, in, in the game, if you, get what I, if you get what I mean. So it all turned bitter and it all turned sour and everybody stopped talking to each other. Everybody started blaming each other. Everybody thought they was onto a good thing and none of it worked out. So all of you with aspirations of being a big time drug dealer, if I was you, I'd have second thoughts because there is always something that can go wrong. And if it goes wrong, goes wrong, the bigger it is, the bigger it goes wrong, the longer you're going to be away, I'm afraid. Uh, so that's that. And the third bit I was going to tell you as well is that one of the biggest drug dealers to ever come out of Jamaica uh, was with me as well. And another thing, what when, you, when you're dealing with dirty money, is that it, all, it always has to be left somewhere as well. Uh, you've always got to trust someone with something. When you're, in, when you're doing badness, uh, money always has to be left there's always someone that has to know where your money is, uh, so to speak, right? You can put your money into businesses uh, uh, to clean up the money or whatever so that you can say, no, my money comes from this and my money comes from that. It all doesn't matter. Even if half of it doesn't go missing, half of it will. And the majority of the time I found, especially on this one here, which was a real, people used to take the mick out of him as well because apparently the, 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 the lady who was visiting him all that time, had access to most of the money. So all it took really was for her to fall for another man and for him to get access to the man, the big Jamaican man who's doing the big bird and who's got all that money put away because when you've got so much money, it's not like you can walk into a bank and go and put it in a safe place. There's going to be a lot of money put away, hidden in suitcases, under beds like we know. Uh, with no, with nothing uh, to go with, nothing to do with it. So it's basically used for whatever purposes uh, that come along while you're away. By it. so ends up that she ends up uh, legging it with the money, and all he talks about for the whole sentence is, "When I catch her, I'm going to murder her." And I know it's not funny, but it can leave you in this way. So winners in that game? No. Once again, crime. Being a big drug dealer doesn't pay. So that's my bedtime story for tonight. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've enjoyed it. See you tomorrow. Sending loads of love.